Good morning. Welcome to another Global Neuroscience Institute Grand Rounds. It's an honor, an absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Errol Vezendaroglu. He's going to discuss the crossroads of science and technology. Dr. Vez, as he is known, is not only one of the most experienced and well-renowned cerebrovascular neurosurgeons in the country, he is a true innovator in the field of neurosciences. Dr. Vez went to medical school at State University of New York at Buffalo School of Medicine and subsequently did his residency uh, followed by a fellowship in cerebrovascular neurointerventional neurosurgery and neurocritical care at Thomas Jefferson University. He then became the director of the cerebrovascular division, which was one of the busiest divisions in the world, as well as the director of the fellowship uh, of comprehensive cerebrovascular neurosurgery, one of the sought after uh, fellowships. He is currently, uh, he currently is the director of Drexel Institute at of Drexel Neuroscience Institute at Drexel University College of Medicine and holds the Robert A. Groff Chair in Neurosurgery. He is also the chair, chair of Neurosciences at Chester Crozier Medical Center. Errol's, Errol's academic accomplishments are so very vast. He is a primary investigator of numerous clinical and basic science studies related to all aspects of neurosurgical diseases, especially cerebrovascular diseases and continues to be nationally recognized academic leader in the area of cerebrovascular care. As I said, he's a true innovator, being the only surgeon in the world who has developed and patented both an endovascular device for the treatment of cerebrovascular aneurysms and also a clip used in open surgery. He continues to push the envelope, offering intraarterial avastin for GBM therapy, a true academic leader and a true innovator. Without further ado, I present Dr. Errol Vesendaroglu. Great, thanks, Ken. Uh, that, that was a lot. We've known each other 20 years. You could have put that in 30 seconds, but thank you. That was uh, overly kind. Let's see. All right, well, thank you. Um, so this is our last um, uh, Grand Rounds uh, for the year. Uh, we'll start up again in fall. So um, uh, Dr. Glebus asked me to give the last one and kind of put a 30,000 foot view on things. And I know we have um, a really vast array of um, participants from hospital administrators, nurses, doctors, um, uh, engineers, medical students, nursing students. So I really wanted to kind of give an overall picture um, about the neurosciences and, and particularly the where we are with technology. Um, so without further ado, um, you know, I always like to start these types of innovation talks um, with the history of the telephone, oddly enough. And, you know, the analogies are, are really, really very close to where we are in healthcare and medicine. And if you look at, you know, where the telephone started um, and not going back to even the most basic of technologies, but, you know, what a phone looked like um, in the 1800s when the first phone came out to, you know, the 50s. Uh, 70s, 80s was uh, the idea that, you know, we didn't have to be tethered. Um, and then, as we all know, the smartphones, um, which really didn't just change the way we communicate, it, it changed the world. Um, and we really have Steve Jobs to thank for that, for the first person who basically said, we have all this technology, we have to get it into people's hands so that we can give them new tools to be able to innovate and, and to be able to, to really advance humanity. And you know, those things are very, very similar to what we're doing in healthcare. And I would say that what we're doing in healthcare um, is probably more true to that. And if you think about today, what our smartphones are, um, you know, phone is the last aspect. Um, it's basically a, a computer, a way to do commerce, a way to balance a checkbook, a, a way to pay somebody. Um, you can communicate with somebody globally anywhere around the world and, and see them uh, 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 picture perfect. You can control your home devices with it. And unfortunately, we're only just getting into this in healthcare now. And so some of those things I want to incorporate. And so you may be thinking, what the heck does you know, phones have to do with neurosciences? Well, we have to start thinking about neurosciences. And, and we have to get away from neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry. Anything that affects the neurosystem is neurosciences. And it's not just the clinical. We have to start looking at the technology that we have and really start to embrace our, um, our industry partners because that's really where all the fun stuff's happening and quite frankly, the innovation. Um, you know, neurosciences, traditionally in my world, obviously I always thought of as neurosurgery. Um, you know, the neurologists I think also probably see us as a necessary evil if something needs to be cut out of the nervous system. 
Um, but you know, we, we tend to forget about mental health, um, psychiatry, psychology. Um, and now we're starting to look at different things like neuroplastic surgery. Um, and I think on face value, people see that and they think about um, you know, aesthetics and kind of more superficial things. Well, you'll see later in the talk where we're actually doing some groundbreaking things with this based on the premise, excuse me, of neuroplastic surgery. The neurologic emergency room, I'm very proud. G and I um, basically invented it, started it, thought of it. It's been you know, up and going now for 12 years. Um, and we'll show you the benefits of that. Neuropharmacy, um, Natalie Goffman, who runs our um, neuropharmacy division, um, that didn't exist until someone thought of it. And you know, we sat down and said, look, this makes a lot of sense. We use a lot of drugs and, and pharmacokinetics in the neurosciences, and there's really no gatekeeper of it. So um, these things that are being born out of, and again, you see the analogy here where we get into a smartphone concept and it really is, um, uh, I think the neurosciences encapsulates that very well. And one of the problems, a big problem since you know, the beginning of medicine has been the silos, engineering, plastics, you see all these different things and they're all in different silos, all have incredible things to contribute and all with the same goal of advancing healthcare. Um, and, you know, the, the elephant in the room is the biggest silo of all, which is industry. We've gotten to a point where industry is so far out of the picture of what we do because of uh, a fear of uh, compliance issues, a fear of, um, you know, stepping over lines. And I think those fears um, uh, are serious fears and they should be taken seriously. But there's ways to eliminate those without just throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and even if you look, my you know, colleagues that do basic science, you know, once they get to a point of something, let me tell you the first people they're going to, 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 to get to the end result is the providers and then industry. So we need to have them in our ecosystem. And one of the problems is that, you know, and this is, this is especially for the younger people out there, for the medical students, engineering students, um, really for anybody who's just starting off their venture in healthcare, it's very important to understand this is the first time probably in the last decade in the history of healthcare, that we have technology that we don't know what to do with. We've outpaced the need. You know, back when, you know, in the ancient times when I was a resident and starting off, I mean, my head would explode thinking about if I could only do this, if we only had a catheter that could go here, if the MRI could only look at this level at the brain and we could understand cellular level of uh, the uh, uh, integration of, of neurons and, and how cells communicate. That's all here and it's coming in a floodgate. So you go from blind where you don't have the tools to where you can become reckless, where you get something in your hand and just because you can do something, it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And that, that becomes you know, an ethical consideration. On the other end of that spectrum, we certainly don't wanna be in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, you know, we, I, I'd much rather be up in that left corner where all this new technology is at your hands. So you have to embrace this technology. And, and just by human nature, um, new things that come along, we get stuck in our ways and, you know, quite frankly, get lazy. Um, you know, EMR is a perfect example, um, you know, dealing with putting everything into a computer instead of just writing or picking up a phone. Um, it's a better system, but it, but it incorporates change and the way we think. So we constantly have to be doing that. And I want to, you know, uh, this is, my, this talk is, is an amalgamation of about 10 different lectures. And, and this is a lecture that I, I gave recently um, at, at one of our national meetings um, when we started thinking about some of the telemedicine technology we're using. Now, everybody that's listening to this has uses telemedicine, right? It may not be medicine, it may be Zoom, it might be, I don't even know if people use Skype anymore. But Zoom pre-pandemic, most people didn't even know what it was. And the people that did were like, oh, yeah, that's one of those platforms where you get on video, it's clunky, it doesn't work. Well, you know, since the 1870s, the concept of transmitting an image with audio over a wire was born. Um, and it was done in a very, very, very basic form. That's the 1870s this technology has been around. 1927, they actually made it happen. Bell Laboratories um, connected uh, in Washington, um, connected uh, uh, Washington, D.C. officials and the president of AT&T um, in New York City to, to officials in Washington, D.C. by a two-way audio connection and one-way video. Um, so think about that. That was 1927. This technology has been dormant since that time. Why is it booming now? 
because we were forced to use it because of the pandemic. And, and again, not just healthcare, um, in commerce. Uh, I do, we all do telemedicine every day. I did it yesterday and I was on with an 87 year old, an 87 year old patient who was sitting there and had no problem getting on. So, you know, we finally are starting to embrace this in medicine. This is some technology um, with artificial intelligence and telemedicine. So this is when a, a stroke comes into the emergency room, time is brain. And this is a technology called Viz AI, where I'm in bed, I get a ping on my phone, I pick up my phone, and this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a CAT scan that's coming up with a CTA that's telling me that I have a patient with a large vessel occlusion who has a stroke in the emergency room. So I'm looking at the films, I can scroll through it, and I can see over here on the left that there's a middle cerebral artery occlusion, um, and it's a cutoff. So now immediately, what do I need to do? I need CT perfusion. Well, the artificial intelligence already understands there's a large vessel occlusion and that sequence is done. And you can see on these CT perfusion studies, there's a large part core penumbra. What does that tell me? I have to go in and do an intervention that that large vessel occlusion needs to be open. And what's absolutely remarkable about this is there's no human interaction here. Everything that you just saw was done by artificial intelligence. Not, there wasn't even a CT tech. Someone obviously got the patient on the table. None of those images had to be um, uh, processed and it automatically went through. And I just hit on my phone, um, I, I hit one ping and I can call my interventional team in. So these are the types of things that are really changing the way uh, we, look, we, we look at healthcare and how we can deliver healthcare um, and, and the things that we need to incorporate more and more. And I know, you know, everybody has a mentor in their life, um, whether, you know, it's a, a nurse, a doctor, a, a, an engineer, it, it could be anybody. Um, and this is somebody who was my mentor in Buffalo, um, a gentleman named Nick Hopkins, um, who basically uh, started neurointervention based on what the cardiologists were doing in the 70s and 80s with doing intervention for cardiac procedures you know, he said, we've got to start doing this in the brain. And I can tell you that he became a pariah in neurosurgery. Um, he was basically not embraced by anybody, but he never gave up. And he's the most remarkable human being in the world. And, you know, this is, this is kind of where I started and, and Dr. Lieben started, you know, this new kind of generation of people that started to think about vascular surgery differently. And this is a traditional, this is an aneurysm. You can see there's a clip that goes on. It's like a little closed pin that gets pinched off the neck of the aneurysm. And this is a very invasive surgery. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of what it looks like. We're retracting the brain. We're under a microscope. You know, small vessel starts bleeding in the brain. This isn't like in the abdomen or anywhere else where you can just stick your hand in there, or put a clamp on, you're dealing deep in the brain. And, you know, there's a serious rite of passage for this. Um, there's a, a, a lot of pride amongst the vascular neurosurgeons who did this. And so when someone came along and said, that's crazy, you don't need to do this anymore. We can just put a little puncture in somebody's groin and go up. You, you can imagine there's a lot of resistance, um, not because they didn't believe in it, but because I think it was change and change becomes scary, especially when you're king of the mountain. So this is, this is what some of these surgeries look like. And we still do them today. Uh, there's still a, a, a role for them. Um, and they're, they're still... Uh, some patients that this is better than doing endovascular. And that's where that technology, uh, um, you know, versus being blind comes in. But you can see this is from a, a very well-known textbook, surgical textbook. And these are different types of techniques. This is called a picket fence technique um, for wide neck aneurysms. And, you know, again, something, I don't want to say simple, but something more basic of doing open brain surgery for aneurysms. We, we've been doing this for 40 years. So we started thinking about, well, why not just redesign these, these types of, of technologies to make them easier to do so that when people are training and people that don't have as much experience and need to do this. So this is a clip that we designed. Um, it's basically like a, a, a chip clip. So it's a clip that you basically see when you put on your uh, 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 pretzel bag or chip bag. It's the same thing for an aneurysm. It's got the wide blades. It comes down so you don't have to reconstruct, which makes it much safer. Very easy to do. How do we do this? We went to industry and we said, help us make this. So again, uh, just to put into context, I'm a vascular neurosurgeon. I'm, I do open neurosurgery. So I'm not saying this because I don't do it or I don't believe in it. I'm saying that we, we need to push the envelope. There's no more advancements in craniotomy. There's only one way to basically 
gut into someone's skull, take the bone off and open up the brain. Um, you know, there's little things like what you just saw with that clip and the microscopes are getting a little bit better with what we can see. But at the end of the day, it's fully mature. This is this was the first frontier. And this is really what Nick Hopkins brought uh, to the world globally. Um, and this is endovascular technique. So this is an aneurysm that's being coiled. So this catheter, we're starting down in the femoral artery in the groin, snaking it all the way up into the head, and we're plugging the aneurysm from inside as opposed to outside. This opened up a revolution, a slow one, but uh, opened up a revolution. And now we're starting to do a lot of this access through the wrist. And, you know, I, I never want to be a hypocrite. And so, you know, I'll try to push people as much as possible. And my comfort level is going into the groin. It's easy. There's access there. It takes two seconds to get in. It's a nice big artery. Going into the wrist, there's a little bit more fiddle factor and it's new. And actually, you know, Dr. Binning and, and, and Hakma and, and some of the younger colleagues, they basically, they, they, they uh, embrace this and really are starting to do this as standard of care. So now we're doing brain surgery, not from the femoral artery, but the wrist. And when the patient's done with surgery, they're literally holding their own wrist. The recovery time's much better and the access is actually pretty good, albeit with a little fiddle factor. So, you know, these types of, this is an aneurysm of the uh, uh, internal carotid artery system. And you can just see this big mess here with all these lumps and bumps. These are really difficult aneurysms to treat a while ago. And there's really not a lot of good choices endovascularly or with open surgery as well. So what was designed were, uh, 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 intracranial stents. Now this is called a pipeline uh, or a flow diverter. And the idea of it is there's this branch artery and I'm hoping you can see my arrow here. Um, but the branch artery that's coming off is an artery that goes to the eye. It's the ophthalmic artery. You can't just cover this with a stent because you'll cover the aneurysm and blood flow won't go into that, but you'll also shut off the, the normal vessel, which will cause a patient to have a stroke. So this is a, a brilliant, brilliant stent and technology that was invented from, by Kim Nelson and some others from NYU. Um, and actually we did the first animal model at Jefferson. Um, and I remember when Kim called me and said, Kim, you know, I wanna bring this over to the lab. And I was kind of like, yeah, good luck with this. Uh, you know, how are you gonna just get something just porous enough to stop flow to an aneurysm, but keep an artery open. And sure enough, they did it. Um, and this has really revolutionized the way we start to treat these really complex aneurysms. And now we're starting to do them for more and more basic aneurysms. So again, if you see the cerebral vasculature here, starting with the carotid artery in the neck. And so here's our aneurysm and there's normal blood flow. So when we inject contrast with an angiogram, that black that you saw is the blood. So Right here to the left, that long branch coming off is the cryophthalmic artery. And obviously here's the aneurysm. So here's just like the same technology we use for any other type of endovascular procedure in the brain. We put the stent up. And what we do here is we deploy this stent that you see starts to come out of the catheter. And we slowly unsheath it. And this is all down at the femoral artery or actually from the wrist, from the groin. And you can see that it covers the aneurysm. Now watch while it's fully deployed and watch the black. So the black being shot through is, think of it as the blood flowing through the system and watch how the speed of that blood is in that vessel and check the speed out in the aneurysm. So now it's deployed, we're taking everything out. You see that slow flow into the aneurysm, but you see normal flow going out and washing out into all the distal vessels. So what happens over time is as that blood flow becomes more and more stagnant, the aneurysm literally shrinks away. And I mean, I can tell you my 20 years, uh, there's no other treatment where when you come back, the vessel's completely remodeled. Um, you don't see anything. It's like a normal vessel. Um, so here's the problem. When you're done with that, you have a large piece of nitinol metal sticking in, in someone's healthy artery. You have this large stent covering normal healthy vasculature just to pinch off a little blister. Um, so we started to think that there was a better way. And this is a, a, a device called the web, which is an endosacular where you can basically just go in and it's the concept of a uh, mesh stent that goes right within the aneurysm. This is, this is very problematic because it's big, it's bulky and they recur at the neck and they can recur around the side. And when they do, you have a big problem because retreating these is difficult. Um, and there, there's some limitations. So 
when you take away your, your walls, and the walls can be anything, your walls can be an IRB, your walls can be the walls of your institution, your hospital, um, or your own mind, um, and you start thinking about things without walls and without limitations, um, you know, you get a lot more optimistic and you start looking at the glass um, as half full um, and not half, half empty. And so this is something that we developed um, pre, uh, actually way pre uh, before the, um, that last one. And this is basically the same concept, but what you notice is that this opens up like a basket inside the artery. And then once that's done, you can put the coils in. So the coils go in and this holds it in. Why is this different? This is different because first of all, it's safer because you're doing it piecemeal. You're not just putting this big piece of metal that can rupture the aneurysm, but it's also better because if there's recurrence and we know there's a higher recurrence rate in coiled aneurysms, we can just go right back in and put a coil in like this. We don't have this big bulky unit inside the vessel. So that's something that, you know, again, you know, just thinking outside the box. Um, now you get into things like robotics for vascular neurosurgery. And you know, this is technical versus judgments. Robotics has been around for a while. Um, the Da Vinci, uh, many people are, are, have heard of or, or are aware of. Um, that's a very different surgery than neurosurgery. Um, and you can see that you know, this is a surgeon sitting at a, a usually six feet away from the table um, with this device that can either put a carotid stent up or actually even start to quail aneurysms. This is where you start to have to understand the difference between science and art. And you know, are there some roles for this? Yes, if you're in a community where there's one surgeon who is you know, 300, 400 miles away and you need this type of surgery, okay. In 2022, that's less and less and less. To be in the same institution in a large center and have the surgeon just sitting here with a cup of coffee as opposed to being here where the human beings on the table, I'm still trying to get my head around that. Um, but this is not going away. We just have to get into the judgment and the art. That's, that's where human nature and, and as healthcare providers, that's never gonna change. So let's start talking about, you know, we'll get away from vascular now. Let's start looking at all the opportunities that are out there. So again, this goes back to Nick Hopkins' vision of don't just look at, you know, the tools you have in your hand. Think about the tools and how you can expand them into different diseases. Pseudotumor cerebri is a disease that affects uh, usually young females, um, and it's a form of hydrocephalus, and it's really, really poorly understood. Um, a lot of the surgeons just hate seeing these patients, the neurologists, because they're really difficult. They have horrible headaches, very difficult to manage, hard to diagnose sometimes, and you lose your vision. Why? Because the brain, unlike most hydrocephalus, where the ventricles become very big and full, like water balloons that fill up, the density and the, the, the water content fills the brain. So it's like a sponge filling up with water. And that's why the ventricles collapse and the optic nerves become very swollen. Um, so the treatment for this is to shunt, to shunt and divert the fluid. The problem is you have these very small slit ventricles. So you're poking a, a catheter trying to hit this target. Um, and you can imagine you're going through the brain. So what most surgeons do is a lumboperitoneal shunt where we go from the spinal canal in the back where the cerebral spinal fluid is and it drains into the belly. Problem is most of these patients are obese. Um, there's a low flow system. So these get clogged all the time. The revisions are many. Um, it's a pretty disfiguring surgery. Um, and so again, knowing what we know, the technology and understanding the cerebral vasculature, what some, some of our colleagues started to look at was that this is a venous system. So this is the, the transverse sinuses here. This is going up to the sagittal sinus. You can see there's a narrowing here. There's a stenosis. So the emptying of ve the uh, venous blood in the brain, which is where the cerebral spinal fluid drains into in the brain, there's a backlog here. So the idea was if we open this up, the venous blood will drain more, but so too will the CSF. So this is something that we started doing and actually are doing pretty actively now are stenting these for pseudotumor cerebri. So now instead of a patient coming in and getting a, a shunt, they're getting a stent in their sinus. And, and it's actually, you know, we're still waiting on the overall data, but I can tell you there's some remarkable cases. Well, what about this? This is a recent case that was done at, at, at our affiliate St. Christopher's Hospital. This is a, a baby who had shaken baby syndrome. Um, a really sad case, had a subdural hematoma that you see here. And as it liquefied, the um, uh, patient went to the operating room, had a burr hole, removed the fluid, came back, removed the fluid, came back. This is very common, especially with kids. So again, looking at the same technology of these types of um, uh, uh, pathophysiologies, 
started looking at what happens in these with this exudate, not acute blood, but why does this, these hygromas, why does this fluid collection uh, reestablish? And if you look at the capillaries uh, uh, phase along the pia and the meninges in the brain, um, they're very robust. And so there's a, 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 a philosophy that there's, a, um, there's an exudate there. Um, so what started happening was, some, again, some colleagues who uh, actually in Japan started looking at embolizing and just shutting down. The, this is a superficial uh, artery that goes to the face, uh, the middle meningeal artery um, and, and to the temple region, but goes to the dura. You can see this blush up here, and this is that child. So we basically endovascularly occluded this and the, uh, oh, I don't have the other, and then this goes away. And I apologize because I didn't put the last, but this one within six weeks, this resolves uh, and then becomes this. So this is a really, really common procedure that's being done now, even though it's not fully understood. And I can tell you that I, the reason I know it's accepted is um, uh, neurosurgeons are present, young neurosurgeons who have to present their cases before they sit through their oral boards um, are presenting these as cases and they're being done all over the country. Um, so again, we're going from not only just less invasive to more invasive to less invasive, we're starting to finally get forced to understand the pathophysiology and use the tools we have. Again, going back to what we did with Zoom. So this is a, a, a picture. Um, and usually when we're live, I, I pull the audience. And I just did this at the AANS residence course and um, no one got it. I offered a, for, to buy someone a lunch, dinner or a scotch if they get it. But this is a microcatheter, this little dot. And this ball of blood vessels that's in the brain, you ask people what it is. People say it's a fistula, it's an AVM. Um, lots of different things. What this is, is a brain tumor. This is the vascular supply to this tumor, which is a glioblastoma multiforme or high-grade glioma. And almost every tumor has a really robust blood supply. But in the past, radiologists that were doing cerebral angiograms, if for whatever reason they happened to be doing it and the patient had a brain tumor, which wasn't that often, they would see the blush, but they wouldn't think anything about it. But more and more as, as neurosurgeons start doing endovascular and we start doing embolizations, we would see like, wow, that's, there's a GBM and look at that blush. So what is this? This is a roadway to be able to treat this tumor. So John Bookbart Cornell, at the time Cornell did a lot of legwork with basic science to be able to use this technology to treat these tumors uh, with chemotherapy directly. And um, we were, I believe, the second. Um, as soon as we saw this, I brought John up and, and we started looking at this. And this is a patient who had two surgeries, radiation, standard of care, stop therapy. And uh, we started doing this as a young gentleman, um, uh, basically it was aphasic, hemiplegic, um, just getting worse. And that's what happens with these disease. And we enrolled him and it just shrunk away over time. Um, are we curing GBM? No. Um, are we offering a better treatment? I think so, um, because it's the same treatment. It's just less invasive and we can do it more often. And I think it's better because now it can open up the door to say, hey, that's the wrong drug, which it is, Avastin. We need a better drug. And again, this is a black eye on uh, uh, us in the neuro world of um, you know, how bad we are with this tumor. Everybody's talking about you know, gene therapy, immunotherapy, we have not gotten any further than we need to be. And, and many of you may know someone who's, who's had this disease and it's just absolutely tragic. And you know, this, is a, this is a case uh, not that long ago of a young 26 year old who was diagnosed with this and actually was smarter than her doctors because she knew what the outcome was gonna be. And she said, I'm gonna control my own life. And she decided to take her own life in a stage way before it got to the point where this gentleman was. So you know, that's, a, that's a black eye on all of us that we have to do better. And the only way we're going to do it is with technology. So I want to get into how we can do that. So we talked about, you know, treatment for, for these brain tumors. Well, let's, let's look at some other vascular problems that we have. So this is a hypertensive hemorrhage. It's a basal ganglia hemorrhage, and it's an intrastremal hemorrhage. And this is the only subtype of stroke that does not today have a definitive treatment. It's the only one today that we really have an advanced care. I'm not gonna talk that much about stroke. Um, uh, I will tell you in the last 10 years, that's all I ever talked about um, uh, a lot because that was uh, something that we were trying to get people to convince that endovascular therapy was the right way to go. And the, the amount of resistance was mind boggling. Um, and you know, many people forget that some of our large academic institutions here 
um, some hospitals with undeserved prestige, I'll leave it at that, actually wrote tomes in major publications, including Lancet, about how it didn't work, about how it was, you know, cowboys just using catheters, and it was in some cases more dangerous. So there was a battle that needed to be fought there. Well, here's our new battle. It's intratribal hemorrhage, and, and how do you take care of this? This is not an emerging case, even though it looks like it. Um, this is a patient that comes in very often with a hypertensive bleed in the brain, but they're not herniating, they're awake, they're alert, um, and they're plegic on one side because of where this bleed is. How do we get this out in a less invasive way and help these patients with recovery? Well, let's start thinking outside the box. So what does this have to do with that? Well, this is, these are our orthopedic colleagues who we have about as much in common with as, you know, um, uh, I, I can't even think of, we're pretty much on the opposite end of the uh, uh, spectrums, but this technology that they use every day, we are way ahead of us of using minimally invasive approaches to get into joints. And if you look at what knee surgery was 30 years ago and what it is today, it's night and day. So this, why can't we use the same concept? Basal ganglia bleeds. This is a multiple, multi, I could give a two talks on the trials and the history of this. So going in, quote unquote, minimally invasive. At the end of the day, if you're going to surgically remove and you're going to remove bone and dura, this is what it is, um, period. It doesn't matter what the size of the, the trocar, the size of your, it doesn't matter. You're going to have to dig into the brain and an already irritated brain to get it out. And that's why the trials all really never showed much promise. So one of the things that came along was a device um, that uh, called the Apollo, where we could use a bunch of different technologies. And this is a company called Penumbra, where we could go in with an endoscope through a very small opening. But you look at this, and I think this is Dr. Lieben doing this case. Um, you can see there's image guidance. There's a huge Stortz microscope. It takes a sur one surgeon to do nothing more than stand there and hold this, the other surgeon doing the work. So it's, you know, this is model A to say the least. Um, and this is what it looked like, sorry. So this is a small startup company that somebody reached out to me and said, this is a device that we're using in orthopedics. It's a handheld device in the office with a little needle and trocar where we can inject it into a joint space and basically view a meniscus. It, it's 10 times better than an MRI. And we're actually getting up to being able to, you know, take out tissue and do things like that. And this thing is literally handheld, uh, it's HD quality. And the second I saw this and he showed this to me, I immediately thought of intracerebral hemorrhage and how painful that other setup was. So with engineers, you know, again, this is kind of where we're talking about, we're putting our money where our mouth is and not just saying all these pie in the sky things. We developed this. This was literally with the engineer who helped develop this um, and some of us, some of the neurosurgeons and just sat up and we, we squatted in a lab um, and basically would work with, they're called gel heads with uh, pig blood. And this is one handheld device where you have suction irrigation. This stars for image guidance. So it's like GPS. We can see wherever we are in the brain and uh, we can suck and irrigate. And so we started using this at fellows courses and that's the gel head there. Um, and you can see where, you know, we were able to teach, but also kind of perfect it of how it worked. And you can see there's the visualization. And then let me see, hopefully I have this in here. Here we go. This is during COVID. So this is the first case in human with that exact device that was developed. Um, this was, uh, the first model A, this was the height of COVID with a patient that came in that needed this surgery. And you can see there's, uh, small hole size of a, a, a quarter and we're looking at, at, at all this. And you can see, I'm trying to get to where the, um, the quality of the vision, this is just kind of coming out is, is again, HD quality. Um, and this, this wasn't any you know, groundbreaking, the technology was all there. It was just putting it together. And the key being working with our colleagues, you know, the engineers of, and the engineers actually listening and not getting in their heads that, well, we're gonna do this. And I, you know, my understanding of this is this, of saying, no, stop and listen, this is what this is. Um, so this is a, uh, uh, actually there's some video here, um, but that uh, last, this is a, a Invisi shunt. When we put shunts in the head, this is what they look like. This is a CAT scan showing how high the um, profile is. And this is something called Invisi shunt, neuroplastic surgery. Uh, one of our colleagues at Johns Hopkins, Chad Gordon, um, who started the specialty of neuroplastic surgery, developed this, and it's simply an inlay. So we can just put this 
shunt into a inlay um, in the head. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, first of all, aesthetically, this is a I'm gonna, this is a um, really lovely woman who is a patient of mine uh, who is a teacher, uh, retired, and you can see her hair. Um, you know, she has a beautiful hair, but she, her right here is where her shunt would be. And she would have a big bump here for the rest of her life. That is, you know, it, it's very, very um, uh, uh, limiting from an aesthetic standpoint, from a psychological standpoint. And this, you can't even see it. I mean, she, it's just absolutely seamless. And it changes people's lives, not just what we're doing in the brain, but thinking of the patient as a whole. And so getting together with these brilliant people, we started to really st start to think outside the box. Let me see if I can, there we go. And started to be able to develop more and more and more. And this is a company called Longevity. Um, and so we started working really with them, Dr. Gordon. And these are cranioplasty implants that we put when we remove skull. And normally they're, they're white plastic, uh, methyl methacrylate, different types of materials. You can't see through them. So they're kind of like, okay, what if you could see through it? You're like, okay, well, that's pretty cool because you can see through it. And when you're closing, you can see if there's any blood right before you close and everything looks okay. Then it became, well, what else do we need to see in the brain? Well, when we do bypass surgery, um, the head's closed and there's a little fistula where we bypass, we bypass two arteries. And the whole goal is, is that flow still communicating between that bypass? Well, before, every time you needed to check that, you had to do a CTA you had to do invasive studying, an angiogram. Now with this clear, here's a fistula right here of a, um, this is not a fistula, it's a, a, a the, um, bypass connection. With this clear plastic, we can in the office, put an ultrasound up to the patient's scalp and be able to just take an ultrasound handheld and look and check the patency of that um, uh, uh, bypass, which is really, really, really kind of, um, I think gonna change the surgery, even though unfortunately I, I keep telling my colleagues and they don't want to hear it. The surgery is going by the wayside because it's, there's just a lot better ways to, to, to treat. Um, so that opened up a whole nother world. So neuroprosthetics, which has been around for quite a while, and you're going to start to see all these things start to come together. So this is what's called an, uh, an array and Dr. Um, Sarkar and Dr. Colpan and others um, at GNI that do functional neurosurgery. Um, you can put these little arrays on to detect seizures, to interrupt seizures, to detect what is going on in the brain and be able to send feedback to the brain to uh, either make it do something or, or make it stop doing something. And this is kind of in its earliest form, what it looks like. And I don't know about you, but I'm not sure if I'd rather be walking around with something like this coming out of my head or not be able to move an arm. I mean, it's, it's a pretty bulky invasive thing. The technology's there, but you know, People need, need to start thinking beyond this. Um, but this is what can happen. Uh, this is a patient that basically is moving her, this robotic arm with her arm. Look at her left arm, how she's bringing up. Just her brain is saying, I want to move that. And the electrical impulses are being fed to this robot and she's doing it. But again, you see what's coming out of her head to do this. Um, so again, the technology is what's important. Same thing with the shoulder surgery. So this is, this is actually a... a live surgery, Dr. Uh, Sarkar, some of you may have seen this, I think on his talk, but this is what we do. He's awake in the operating room um, and you can see he has Parkinson's and you can see this tremor here. So what Dr. Sarkar is doing is explaining the surgery to him. And basically behind doors or behind this curtain is a neurophysiology team. And that array is that, that, that electrodes injected into his brain. And what they're gonna do is interrupt pathways and stop that tremor and you can watch what they're doing now is they're, they're stimulating. As they turn the stimulation on to help interrupt these, these uh, uh, signals, watch what happens with his arm. As it goes up, the tremor literally goes away. So this shows what we can do surgically to control. What do we have to do is instead of putting things in the head, using that type of a cranioplasty and now using it like a phone. All, think of everything, all the software you have in your smartphone, and, and, and but think about how small the mechanics are. We can do all of this in the brain. All this technology is, is, is there and able to do. What we have to do, though, is make it compact so it's literally part of your skull, just like a smartphone. So there's the array that goes, lays onto the brain. The electrode uh, 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 channel is thin. You don't feel it. It goes under the skin. And this battery pack and computers basically in your brain, in your skull, just like that. So is this science fiction? No.
this is, this is again, started with neuroplastic surgery with, you know, hiding shunts to clear fits to this. So this is actually Chad. So this is a, a young child who was in trauma um, and had a hemicraniectomy where we have to remove half the skull. And you can see there's the clear fit. And so what the cardiologists have been doing and other people have been doing for a while is if you have, a, 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 you wanna have your heart rate monitored, there's Bluetooth technology where you have a little patch on and by, by Bluetooth, it goes to a base station and someone can see that an alarm goes off and a doctor and nurse, whoever can say, Mrs. Jones is an AFib. This is what's going on. Calls a patient. It's all recorded. It's live. It's real time. And so, you know, Chad started thinking uh, with some of his colleagues at Hopkins, why don't we do this in the brain? So here's a pressure monitor that this child um, had hydrocephalus and it becomes, you change the pressure dynamics in the skull, all the fluids expanding, you put the cranioplasty on, now it's compacted, the drainage is not um, as fluent, and then the patient's delayed, get hydrocephalus. And it's a real problem, especially for parents, um, you know, because the kids are complaining of headaches, some of the younger kids can't communicate that well. So now this child had this uh, uh, um, uh, programmed so that this implant and this pressure monitor is in his head, hooked up to this monitor. So now when mom calls the office, they can just get onto this and say, you know what, Mrs. Jones, don't worry about it. The ICP is seven. There's nothing to worry about. Um, and this was, this is that, that, that child. And, and this is a, a, a case that uh, uh, they published. Um, and this is, you know, this is where we need to be going with this. Um, we're doing it with EEG. Um, this is a device that we were the first in the region to start using this. We work very closely with them, a company called Cerebel. Um, I actually went to a patient's home um, uh, in the pandemic, uh, the uh, husband thought she was having seizures. So this is a first device that can give us really, really good information, where this is a headband that uh, you don't need a tech, you don't need anybody can just put this on. Uh, there's a little clasp here, as long as it's tight along the forehead, connect it to a Bluetooth box. And now our epileptologist can read this anywhere. Um, and be able to uh, record, to be able to speak to the patient, to be able to say, hey, what's happening? Are they, you know, did this fall off? Um, are they having seizure activity? Um, and this is changing the way we are able to do this in hospitals, which costs hospitals infinite amounts of money to the point where many just transfer a patient that might be having a seizure all the way, sometimes into another state to be monitored, but also for patients at home. Same technology. So, but you know, we're way far behind. There's a lot we should be doing and, and can be doing. And, and to put it in context, you know, 1 billion people a year are affected by a neurologic disorder in the world, a billion. You think about that. And this is starting to eclipse anything, including cancer. Um, it's 15% of the entire medical burden in the US right now. And that's more than all cancer combined. And this doesn't even include mental health. This does not include mental health. You add that and it's obviously through the stratosphere. Um, does neurosciences make money? Yes. This is an outdated slide. Um, we have a new one that we actually just put together for a, a, a pro forma. Neurosciences together um, basically is uh, eclipsing cardiovascular. Um, that's uh, all forms of cardiovascular for um, number one revenue source of downstream revenue for hospital systems. So now imagine we're in the process of how do we bring all this together? And I, I, I specifically use the word place and not hospital, not center, not, you know, um, institute. Imagine a place where you take all of industry, brightest and best. You take all the engineers, you take all the researchers, you take all the people who are working in pharma and you get the best doctors. When I say best, I'm talking about the people who are, their goal is to innovate and their goal is to push the envelope. The, the experts who, who understand the disease they treat every day better than anyone and you had them all together under one roof and they all had access to patients and patients knew of this place to come to. Imagine a place where every aspect of neurologic disease was treated with one, and this is a key word that an architect came up with, a departmentless hospital. Think of a hospital that is departmentless, that is just disease specific. We don't do that, we do this. Every neuroscience hospital today standing in this country and actually globally, is based on surgery. It's, it's a, there's a, a surgical emphasis. Why? Because that's what pays the bill. That's what makes money. Is it important? Yes, I'm a surgeon. I, I, I think it's important in, in many ways, but you can't forget about everything else and you can't put it in a silo. So you imagine again, from ALS to Alzheimer's 
um, you know, to head trauma, um, to subarachnoid hemorrhage, everything is treated under that umbrella because it's all neurosciences and the teams are what's focused. Um, and the focus was on the patient and innovation in that order and not on being a system, not on being, and again, why do I say that? You know, I think a lot of um, uh, criticism of, of, you know, physicians and healthcare providers um, by hospital administrators for lack of a better word, and I think it's not unfounded, is that, you know, there's, with no money, there's no mission. Um, but, you know, how do you keep that balance? Well, that's why I showed that slide of revenue. We're not talking about some orphan uh, uh, disease specialty. You know, we're not talking about some rare infectious disease. We're talking about the number one revenue stream in healthcare um, in this country today. So let's take that and be able to do all the right things and the good things with it. And a system that's collaborative, not competitive. You take away the silos and the competition goes away. Now what you're competing against is the disease. So this is, um, this is uh, 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 things that we're gonna, you know, we're in the process of doing and I'm gonna share a little bit with you with what we're doing with this. Um, and stroke, you know, I think there's a lot of people that, that kind of, especially when they hear, um, you know, myself or, you know, one of my, my colleagues, Dr. Uh, Binning, Dr. Hakma, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Liebman, and now Dr. Rami, that, you know, stroke's going to be in there. And, and I don't know about the rest of you, but if I see one more picture of a middle cerebral artery with a clot in it, and then the next picture with it's gone and what the clot looks like, I'm going to put a bullet through my brain and I'm going to need a departmentless hospital because it's, it's plumbing. It's, we got to get beyond that. That's great. Let's pat ourselves on the back, you know, and again, we're putting our money where our mouth is. We did the first mechanical thrombectomy um, uh, in a trial, in a U.S. Uh, a trial in this country. We were authors of the Dawn trial, which was the first New England Journal of Medicine. You know, we, we did it. Been there, done that. We're not saying it because there's bad blood or we're jealous. Let's move on. Let's start looking at neuroprotectives. Okay, we open up the artery. Well, what about all those cells? You know, you know how many times we open up an artery and the patient still doesn't do well, even though we get to them in time? Let's start understanding collaterals with better vascular imaging. Let's start, again, delivering neuroprotectives. We're doing that. We're delivering calcium channel blockers through a catheter after we open up the artery in a trial. Um, do we know what the outcomes are? No, but if my family's there, I'm on that table, do I want that? Absolutely. We know it's safe and we know we've, we've done it all the time before this for other reasons. Protocol, triage, stroke ambulances, our marketing tools, those aren't gonna change the envelope. And, and I'm happy to share that data. That's a whole nother separate talk. We've got to get into the protocols like the artificial intelligence I showed you where we're stopping the middle person and we're stopping all the nonsense and we're getting right to the, the, the care provider that's gonna basically either give a lytic or give intraarterial uh, 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 treatments. Um, so, you know, again, to put this in context and to close it, um, GNI is the only center right now in the country at Crozier giving IVTPA at nine hours, not four and a half hours, nine hours. We're the only ones doing neuroprotectives. We're the only ones getting patients out of bed after IVTPA within 24 hours by checking a fibrinogen level. Standard of care is you have to sit in bed for 24 hours, which is you know ridiculous for lots of reasons. And um, uh, Dr. Benning is about to publish a paper on that. The neurologic emergency room, it is not a marketing tool. And, and, and I think that was a lot of what people thought. And I, I can't tell me pats, I go, oh, you know, that was brilliant, Bez. You know, that was a great way to capture, capture market share. It's not what it's about. It's about triaging these patients. So a patient coming in with stroke symptoms doesn't get triaged into a corner somewhere and starts getting, you know, someone coming in and asking about their insurance and their dog's name and everything else while brain cells are dying. And um, you know, we published a paper on the, 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 the process and some of the early outcomes. And this is something that is awesome because a medical student who started this, who wanted to go into neurosurgery and actually just matched at, at, at Mayo. Um, and I was thrilled to go to his, uh, uh, to, to be at commencement and be there with his parents. He came up with this idea and he basically said, let's look at outcomes. Let's take patients in the neurologic emergency room and compare them in the same emergency room in the traditional ER uh, on off hours and match them and look at their outcomes. So we took 74 patients in the neurologic emergency room, 54 patients in the traditional emergency department, and we compared their outcomes. Door to needle time was 27 minutes in the neuro ED, 65 minutes in the traditional ED. And this is not a, um, a dig at our ER colleagues. These are the same, it's the process. It's getting people in there, getting the, the, if you do something every day, whether you're a nurse, you're a tech, you're a doc, it doesn't matter. 
you're going to you're going to get to these numbers because it's protocol you know what you're doing you know what you're seeing you're seeing all the variants we showed this already but this was what was huge and this was just presented at the international stroke conference by dr greenberg um the average nih on discharge was 3.8 in the neurologic uh, emer emergency room and oh, the average NIH on discharge was five, six in the traditional. And it's a pretty beyond statistically significant. So, you know, it's intuitive. You're getting the patient sooner, they're getting treatment sooner, and they're doing better. Um, and so this is, this has to be the future. So that's, uh, so, you know, what I want to get into now is where we are in our structure. And I'm going to kind of close with this. So we have some time for questions, but, you know, research um, is, uh, that was Dr. Not to fly by, but that was Dr. Uh, um, Goffman, who's a head of our neuropharmacy, and and you know we talked about how that fits into this. But the research piece, these labs, and this setup, this should be in a hospital. This should be in the hospital without walls. And yes, there's going to be physical walls, and there's going to be uh, um, pro, you know walls for firewalls for lots of different reasons, but in the same space. Um, so if you look at a tripod here of, of, you know, research and industry, clinical space, and then kind of outdoor innovation space, all connected uh, by one kind of common lobby, if you will. Uh, imagine all of this going on in a hospital. Imagine this, where there's doctors, nurses, students, engineers, everybody sitting in a lecture hall, which happens every day. But how about the operating room, where up there in that left panel, there's the doctors, there's the, the, the surgeon and the surgery going on, and you can communicate back and forth and explain what's going on and, and discuss things. And you know, here, here's a, a, a brain tumor, right? So talk about, yes, the technical, and this is what we do. This is what the tissue looks like. Well, let's expand that. So this is, um, we're partnering with uh, Zeiss. This is called the Convivo. Um, they're going to be our uh, uh, partners in our new center. Um, and this is a technology that they have. And they, 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 you know, what we're doing is helping them understand from a practical standpoint. So this is, this is confocal microscopy, <laughs> excuse me. And for the basic scientists out there, you know, confocal, it gives us uh, uh, um, much, much, much higher magnification and depth and understanding at a cellular level than what we're looking at, certainly in an operating room. So here's a probe in the operating room that basically... The surgeon's putting in the probe of the abnormal tissue. There's a confocal microscopy up on the screen. And who we're communicating with this is there's the cells that we're looking at. And here's the confocal uh, uh, image. And yeah, we're looking at that and saying, okay, I think I see mitochondria. But right here in this chair, in maybe another building in another state, is our neuropathologist. This is the pathologist workstation. And we're talking just like we are now. And you know that pathologist, she's saying, Dr. Vez, that tissue right there to the left, can you give me a little sample of that? So what does this do? This means there's, I'm getting more specific tissue that I've subjected this person to while they're undergoing brain surgery. And so we don't have to say we didn't get great tissue, we're getting higher yield, but also think about this from a research standpoint. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Sarker is working with uh, um, uh, Dr. Olympia Mariucci at, at Drexel. Um, there's a, a NIH grant going on. There's a lot of great stuff. We're in a consortium, PC4, with, with CHOP uh, in, in brain tissue storage for high-grade gliomas. All of this is going to take this to the next level. Technology, taking multi multiple specialties, and doing something meaningful with it. Um, our industry partners. So here's the big one. Imagine if industry was in the hospital. And um, a whole nother talk, because the first thing, okay, you can't do it. There's compliance issues. Those are all the lawyers talking and everybody else talking about why something can't be done. So what I'll tell you, and I love doing it, I wait to hear all the nonsense of why you can't do it. And I say, oh, that's interesting because it's done. And again, my, my mentor, Nick Hopkins, did this in Buffalo. Industry is in the hospital and there are beyond firewalls. Um, they're actually more restrictive than if you go into any large university now where doctors actually are on boards. Uh, uh, hospital CEOs are on some boards where they're doing hundreds of millions of dollars of business. This is black and white, transparent. There's no relationship. Common spaces. Imagine coming to work every day where this is your common space where you can sit down and collaborate with colleagues and say, hey, let's go up to a conference room and um, you know, start talking about this or invite somebody in from Germany who has um, you know, some technology that you want to look at and say, you know what? This is awesome. We're going to bring in um, one of the engineers from Zeiss and we're going to sit down again in the same space. This is that lobby we're talking about. Um, this is that lobby that connects those three buildings. 
And you can see on the, the right here, that's not by mistake. So these are actual renditions of, of what this new place is gonna look like. And yes, it is a real place. And this is what this is right here. And this is I-95. And these are the three pods um, of where exactly what we just talked about are gonna happen. And if it, for not for COVID, um, this would, I don't think be done by now, but there would be a building there by now. So this is um, on its way. Um, really, really excited about this. Um, I think this is going to change healthcare. Um, I'm beyond proud that we're, you know, not only doing it in this country, but we're doing it here locally uh, because there's no better um, center of innovation and the best and brightest minds in, in this tri-state area, both from industry, research, academics, um, as well as, as clinical medicine. So we're bringing all that together. So I will close with that. And I think we have about five minutes. I'm happy to take any questions. Whoop. Uh, and I will stop my share. That was that was that was fantastic, Errol. As usual, it was just such a great talk. Uh, I learned so much. There's uh, so many comments about how great that talk was. So I'll get to the questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The first question I see is: There a national agency providing funding for the new research? That's a great question, and and I'm not sure who's asking it. And that, and I and, and I'm I'm going to assume, but I assume it's somebody um, who's as old as I am. Um, because that has been, and, and if there's any other message, I, I just cannot emphasize that enough. And it breaks my heart when I hear, especially the, 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 the graduate students and the younger scientists, they're so focused on that. There, yes, there is, and it's called industry. And there's tens of billions, not millions, billions of dollars. And guess what? It doesn't have to go through an NIH clearinghouse. It doesn't have to go to all the things that I just showed you were 100% funded by industry. Um, industry has the money, they have the cash. And right now, uh, I will tell you the hottest venture capital market, and you can talk to anybody in finance, is healthcare. And it's not just the healthcare of technology, it's this, it's delivering healthcare. You see these large uh, uh, physician groups that are being bought up left and right by MSOs, which are venture capitalists, which I think is a dangerous thing, but there's beyond funding. Um, and it's, it's industry is the biggest one. Um, another question we have is, <clears throat> what's the thought on increased EMF exposure with increased technology in the body? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. I have. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the thought on increased EMF exposure with increased technology in the body? Uh, someone has to tell me what EMF is. I think someone's assuming I'm smarter than I am. I, 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 I don't know what EMF is. So whoever put that in, if you want to just clarify that, I'm happy to answer it. Oh, magnetic fields. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, magnetic fields. Yes, actually, uh, great question. Um, so we're using and have been using Drexel and actually are going to the next generation now um, to get uh, electronic magnetic uh, uh, therapy treatment. Um, and that is the absolute next frontier. So for those of you that don't know what that is, we can manipulate those pathways that you saw surgically using electromagnetic fields. And it's basically the same technology of MRI with a handheld device in the brain where we can focus in on certain areas and pathways. And we're looking at chronic pain, depression, epilepsy. Um, and we, did, we were using it for chronic pain. Um, and there's some really, really exciting results for that. Um, and there's a, a company called Neurostar based out of New York um where uh this is not going away we're very very heavily invested in that yes great 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 i have a question or we, there were some other questions but um do you think that advancing technology advancing um with all of our innovative um advancements do you think it's a bad thing and that it's going to start replacing jobs and certain specialties in the medical field Great question. I mean, so, I mean, I think it's a two-pronged question. The, the first one is, you know, as I mentioned in those slides, and I really want to emphasize, yes, we have to be very careful because it's really easy to get lost. And again, the old saying is, you know, that we always have, keep our brains thinking about in the operating room is just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Um, and, you know, now the can is there and it's the should that we have to think about. Um, and as far as replacing jobs, 
I don't know. I think it's going to create jobs. I mean, again, look at look at look at uh, the iPhone. Look, I, and you know, I'm I'm a big Apple person, so I think you know, you look at what happened with Steve Jobs and what what I mean. Did that did Jobs get lost from AT and T and from people that made you know hardwired phones? Yes, but look at what it's opened up. So this is going to open up not only new jobs, but it's going to bring in I think other. Um, specialties and other types of commerce that never traditionally were in healthcare into healthcare. Um, this, is, this is actually a really great question. And uh, they admit that it's slightly off topic, but again, a great question. Right. How is the contrast dye shortage affected diagnostic assessment? Oh, great, great question. Yeah, um, it, it, greatly. Um, you know, we, we've had uh, uh, several meetings um, about this because, you know, we're literally triaging patients, you know, who needs an interventional procedure. And obviously there's a, 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 a backup for um, uh, emergencies, but again, that glass empty, half full, half empty, what this is doing, it's for, this is not, in my, in my 22 years, I've never seen this. I've never seen a national shortage of contrast. This is a first. So, and maybe there was one before, I don't know, but it's forcing us to think differently. Let's get MR, you know, instead of doing a CT perfusion on every patient, let's do MR perfusion, MR diffusion, which yes, we can do, and there's no radiation and it can be just as quick. You just have to change your protocols. So um, it is affecting us. We're just basically triaging patients and putting the most important ones up front and being smart about what we're using. Uh, we did three cases yesterday. We diluted all the contrast. Um, so yeah, uh, that's how it's affecting. Also, I think it's making us smarter. I mean, I think what we rather than do sort of these routine studies, we now think about does the patient truly need it? That's so right. Making us a smarter group. Is a, is, is a MRA better? Um, you know, exactly. is a, absolutely. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Uh, and again, it was just really, it was a wonderful talk and a great way to end our grand round session. See you in the fall and we'll be in right. person. I oh, promise. In the fall. Very good. Be well, everyone. Thank you.